Hi everyone, my name is Ellie. I'm a research assistant working for Professor Danny Dumont at the Institut des Sciences de la Mer de Rimouski, a pretty long French word for an ocean science institute located in eastern Quebec. For this presentation, I decided to take you with me on a journey to uh, study what I did during my master's degree, but also to give you a bit of background on what we do in our lab and uh, how we do it, in fact. Right behind me is our uh, sea ice laboratory called Bédu AA. It's uh, actually a quite unique place where we can study various sea ice processes and with a main focus on wave, wave ice interactions. But um, yeah, let's go take a look. This is Bezu AA, our natural sea ice laboratory. But why did we choose this bay specifically? Well, mainly because the ice conditions in this bay are highly dynamic, which allows us to observe numerous sea ice processes related to waves at different moments during the winters. Since 2014, Danny, member of his lab and other collaborators, I've been studying sea ice processes with an ice canoe as a scientific platform. Although rudimentary, the ice canoe offers a reliable platform to conduct sea ice experiments, even in the harshest conditions. Since the main scientific focus is to study wave ice interactions and sea ice rheology, we mainly use the ice canoe to deploy wave buoys, measure ice thickness, and record ice conditions with drones. For example, one of the research objective we have is to quantify the flow size distribution resulting from a natural wave-induced sea ice breakup event. With the right experimental setup, we could then relate these observations to the environmental conditions such as sea ice thickness and wave properties. To complement these in-situ observations, a camera which overlooks the entire bay has been installed at the top of this mountain called Pic Champlain. On the 28th of January 2014, strong winds coming from the southwest generated waves with sufficient energy to break up the entirety of the ice pack enclosed in Bay du Aa. When georectified, we can zoom into the footage to fully scale the process and see it in detail. Well, there's a bit of snow here. I thought I would be able to have a nice shot, but uh, let's take it like this. <laughs> All right. The images that you just seen are quite stunning, but unfortunately, there was no ice canoe deployment on this day. So we're left with only approximations of the environmental conditions that were uh, present on this day. and. You know, with a bit of image processing, we can get information about the CS the, the breakup process, so that's, such as the breakup speed or the flow size distributions, but we cannot relate them to the environmental conditions. So we are left with no more understanding of what we're, uh, we're studying. This observation triggered a realization where uh, timing is important. Timing is really key when studying sea ice processes, especially when uh, you're looking for a specific process. Not only you have to be there at the right moment, but you have to be there uh, when the process is happening and it has to be in uh, good enough uh, uh, weather conditions to, well, <laughs> to, to, to do science, you know? In order to remove the timing issue, Danny had an idea. Why not create a joint experiment with the National Coast Guard where a ship would generate waves while we're on the sea ice with the right equipment to measure the breakup properties? Fast forward a couple of months and I was on the Amundsen, a National Coast Guard ship leading the experiment in the Gulf of St. Lawrence.
But initially, it wasn't planned out like that. At first, I was only supposed to test out the new drone in the hope of finding something interesting related to sea ice. And since the drone deployments were truly opportunistic, the expectations about the outcome of these missions were pretty low, if not absent. One night, I was looking through a window on the ship and saw exactly what I was looking for. We were sailing at high speed and thin ice so that we could see breakup all around. I then rushed straight to the chief scientist, explaining him Danny's idea and how we could do something similar that would be truly unique to the scientific community. Next morning, I was in the wheelhouse with both the chief scientist and the captain looking for the right sea ice to break up. We were actually looking for a plate of sea ice which had a side exposed to open water so that we could sail close to it and generate breakup with the waves of the ship. Let's go and see how it unfolded. All right, so I think it would be meaningful to give you guys a bit of scale about what we're seeing right now. First off, the drone was flying at an altitude of 95 meters, which means that the horizontal extent of the images is about 120 meters. That means that the distance between the main cracks is between three to five meters, but we'll dive deeper into that when analyzing the flow size distribution resulting from this experiment. I think it's also worth noting that the ship actually sailed at a speed close to 14 knot in order for breakup to happen. Okay, there are two main components to these observations. First one is the temporal evolution of the breakup, and the second one is the flow size distribution. For the temporal evolution of the breakup, we analyze the footage of the sea ice being broken up by the waves in order to obtain a wave period, a wavelength, and also to assess the breakup speed. With this information, we can then compare the wave speed to the breakup speed in order to gain information about how the process happens in time. For example, we can plot the fracture distance relative to time and then take a linear regression of this data in order to obtain the breakup speed. When we use this method to calculate the breakup speed, we can then compare it to the phase speed of the waves that propagates into the ice. And what we obtain in our experiment is that it's not simultaneous. It takes an average two and a half waves to bring further the ice edge. For the flow size distribution resulting from the process, we take different frames from the video we took while flying back the drone to the ship in order to create a map of the resulting breakup and then apply some image processing techniques in order to obtain a flow size distribution on that. Okay, now we get into uh, the deeper stuff, if I could say so, uh, coffee. So I've told you that we went from a RGB image and with the help of image processing, we get a full size distribution. But there are in fact 
multiple steps to go from the image to the flow size distribution. First, the image processing is quite complicated. So to sum things up, we use, we use a specific technique to go from an RGB image to a binary map where ice is labeled as one and water is labeled as zeros. We then have an end uh, a map of sea ice flows that have a bunch of geometrical properties, but the two most important here are the area and the minor axis, which is considered as flow size in our experiment. There are then two main ways to construct the flow size distribution, either a non-cumulative way, which is basically an histogram, or uh, a cumulative way to construct the histogram, which is a bit more com complicated and less intuitive. So we choose the non-cumulative um, flow size distribution in our experiment. After that, the main way to construct it that, that has been used in the observational community is to look at the frequency of observation of each flow size and attribute it its probability based on this frequ frequency of observation. So if we do this approach with our data, we get the following flow size distribution. At first, everything seems all right, but if we look closely at the RGB image and take a closer look at the distance between the main cracks, we get that the mode of the distribution, which highlights a preferential size, is quite at the low value relative to what we can measure in the image. So this um, made me realize that maybe the frequency of observation uh, based uh, flow size distribution might bring some bias when constructing the flow size distribution. From there, I looked at what was done in other spheres of sea ice and I look at the ice thickness distribution. And when you look at it, it's strictly the partial concentration that is used to establish the, the probability of each categories of thickness. So I, I thought, why not use that in the flow size distribution? So if we use the partial concentration to calculate the probability of occurrence of each flow in the image, we get the following distribution. Now, the mode of the distribution fits right on at the value of the main distance between the cracks, so that it better renders what we can see with our own eyes in the image. Okay, so we've got two different ways of constructing the, constructing the flow size distribution. One, we've shown that there's bias into it, and the other one, we show that it better represents what we can see with our own eyes. So I've done the presentation mainly talking about the Gulf of St. Lawrence experiment that we did, but uh, I have to say it inspired us to do another one in the north of Baffin Bay, and we mainly got the same thing, except that uh, it was thicker ice so that we had a preferential size that was at higher sizes than uh, with the thinner ice in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, so with that in mind, we have two experiments that show practically the same robust finding is that a preferential size is generated when a uh, wave induced sea ice breakup happens. That's solid. After that comes the, well, the realm of interpretation and of comparison with theory. And that comes with a lot of approximation, especially when we're left with only approximations of the environmental conditions, since there were no, uh, there were no ice canoe deployment or uh, apparatus deployed on the ice to measure wave or ice properties. In the end, the two main contributions that we've seen in this presentation are that there's a novel way to create the flow size distribution, which is better for the statistical analysis of the data. And the other one is that we obtain a shape of the flow size distribution resulting from wave-induced sea ice breakup. In order to overcome the issues related to the missing information about the environmental conditions, we plan on doing more and more deployments of ice canoe in Bezo AA, where we can hopefully have the right timing conditions to finally be able to have a complete portrait of wave induced sea ice breakup. Thank you for watching my video and I hope you enjoyed it. Cheers.